You're locked into Inception Radio Network, Superior, Wisconsin. Welcome to Just Energy Radio with your host, naturopath and medical intuitive, Dr. Reed Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theory that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating. From the swinging of a pendulum to the waves of the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day, each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is when we take everything in our universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita Louise on a journey through time and space where past, present, and future collide. Today, what you believe may be called into question. What we want to know is, who made up the rules? Be brave and step outside the box. We are about to turn our world upside down and venture into the unknown. Hold on. We are departing our own beliefs and entering alternative realms. Enjoy the possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. Yet another great episode for you. Today we're going to be speaking to Brandon Hurd about ancient American secrets revealed. But Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, psychic readings, and energy healing. So if there's stuff going on in your life, if you need to get some guidance on where to go next, issues going on in your career, and especially if you have some health issues that you need some uh, help working through, explanation, the doctors can't really figure out what's going on with you, give me a call, send me an email, and we can set up a time for a private consultation. Also on my webpage are links for uh, the release of my book, E.T. Chronicles, which has just was just released this past week, October 1st, as well as my video icon, Deconstructing the Archetypes of the Ancient. That's a video download that you can get on Amazon.com, but the links are on the, well, they're on my Soul Healer webpage, soulhealer.com. It's also, the show is also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.appliedenergeticsinstitute.com, where you can become a medical intuitive, intuitive counselor, or certified energy medicine practitioner. And for the month of October, we are having a blowout sale. So if you sign up for the program this month, you will receive 30% off our training. If it's something you're interested in, you might want to download our 50-page free guide, Jumpstart Your Intuition. Let's see, uh, any other announcements today? I... That's well, actually, one last thing in a couple of weeks is the History Haunts and Legends Conference in Spooky Jefferson, Texas, one of my favorite events to go to. I'll be there speaking. Uh, it is November 1st in Spooky Jefferson. And so, if you are in the Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas area, or f- further out than that, it's something you might want to check out. Uh, you can get more information at uh, jeffersonghostwalk.com and that event is November 1st, Saturday, November 1st. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit about Brandon and get him on the air. Brandon Hurd is a U.S. Army veteran with service in Afghanistan and Iraq. He has a master's degree in psychology as well as a B.S. in management. He has researched and reported on mysterious locations throughout the United States, Europe, and the Middle East. He is an instructor for the U.S. Army Command and General Staff Officer School, as well as secondary education teacher. His book is Ancient Mississippi, and please welcome to Just Energy Radio, Brandon Hurd. Hey, Brandon, how are you? Hey, I'm doing fine. Thanks for uh, having me, Dr. Rita. Well, I am just so glad to have you come on. You know, there aren't that many people that really research antiquities in America. So it's always nice to kind of balance things out because people are always, you know, investigating Egypt and Iraq and all these other places. 
And I think there's just a big hole, which we're going to kind of talk a little bit more about what's going on in America. Um, but I just think that there's a big hole and I'm glad that you're looking to start starting to fill those gaps. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you know that there is a big hole. There's a, a huge gaping hole. OK. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a school of thought that can, I believe, uh, fill that hole. And it's well, it's called diffusionism. But we'll get uh, to that. We okay. are like so not there yet. So uh, okay. not there yet. But I wasn't going to go here, the here yet. But why do you think that, you know, we go and we investigate all of these other countries? Why isn't there any investigation that's really happening in the United States? I mean, you know, my little conspiracy theory mind jumps in on this whole question. But I, I'd like to get your thought on that topic. Well, I mean, history is, is an industry uh, in the academic world. In the academic world, uh, what is quote unquote accepted history? Uh, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, of effort and a lot of uh, people's reputations are at stake. So they're you know not really uh, very open to ideas or evidence that falls outside of quote unquote accepted history. Well, all right. You want to hear my little conspiracy theory thing? I've got one, too, but you go first. Okay. So my little conspiracy theory is that if they give the Native Americans credit for the successes that they've had and the uh, level of culture that they have experienced, then we couldn't call them savages and just take their land away. That's exactly my conspiracy theory, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great minds yeah. think alike. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, back to the real show. So let me ask you this. How did you get interested in investigating what's going on, you know, in your own backyard? Well, it uh, started just a few years ago where I had uh, wrote, written an article for uh, Mississippi Magazine about a uh, uh, more, much more recent historical location in Natchez, Mississippi called the Devil's Punch Bowl. And that story was, it's one of those places where the truth is uh, stranger than fiction. And it you know, involved America's first serial killers, uh, uh, you know, slave uprising, you know, buried pirate treasure, uh, sexual mutilation, murders, all in one little small place in Natchez, Mississippi. And so I wrote that, and then I was looking for uh, 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 the next great thing. And I, I found that I like to write about mysterious people, places, and things. So I uh, got on the internet and I googled up "mysterious Mississippi," and that's kind of how I fell into the rabbit hole. <laughs> because more than like one web page came up. Well, it was there was one particular story from a, a nineteen hundred uh, issue of the New York Times, and. Um, talked about a, uh, a mysterious structure in, in a remote part of Mississippi that they refer to as the Brandywine Stone Wall. And uh, so it goes on to describe a assortment of cut and placed stones that, if they were stacked high, would, would uh, cover an area four miles by four miles. And that's pretty impressive for a structure. And it went on to suggest that this was a, some unknown ancient civilization must have constructed this. So I took that as kind of a challenge, and I went to the Department of History and Archives, and I'm digging through all the records. And in fact, back in the late 1800s, there was considerable debate about this structure. Or was it a structure, a you know, man-made structure, or natural formation? And the field reporters at the time, the, the people who wrote the reports from the field, uh, strongly suggested it was a man-made structure. However, in the, the editorial remarks, you know, they, they were going back and an argument ensued where they were saying that, well, it's the geologists agree it's a natural formation. Well, I'm saying it's kind of both. There is a natural formation of stones there. And they do resemble, they just generally resemble cut 
stones. However, there are certain areas where, in fact, they have been placed and arranged by, by an ancient civilization uh, and used for various purposes. So I get out and I go to this part of the state and I'm knocking on doors for a few days and I eventually ended up at a property that was owned by, the owner had recently died and uh, he was generally a hermit and all over this property there was cut stones. Uh, some of them had inscriptions and markings on them. There was a nine foot long carved snake out of stone with a, it had a, 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 a polished flat top and it had a bowl carved into the back of it. Uh, it also had like snake, uh, the sides were carved and it had like snake rings carved around the tail. There were three uh, large stone heads that we were pulled out of a pond beside the property. And some other artifacts that, that, that are kind of the signature artifacts of, uh, of, a, of an ancient civilization that, that is accepted to have been in the area at that time. Uh, it's called the, the Poverty Point Culture. Okay, so, um, you know, these walls are interesting because you're talking about this wall that's in Mississippi. You know, mm -hmm. I used to live in Rockwall where there's the rock wall of... Rock wall, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and it seems like there has been this activity and this building activity happening in the U.S. that they don't even understand why they were doing it. So let me ask this question: So is this all right? So I'm just, I mean, because up until your material, I've never heard of this, and actually okay. until I moved to Rockwall, I never heard of the rock wall of Rockwall. Um, mm -hmm. But the one in Rockwall, I mean, it's kind of a rectangle shape so is this thing in some kind of a shape or is it straight you know anything like that uh it, it was an area that has been heavily flooded uh throughout the early 1900s so you know if there was a much larger structure it would have certainly been covered up by now but but what what is there now are uh some outcroppings of these stone mm -hmm. stones that have been placed and and uh, and mortared together in certain areas. And see, the mortared together part, I think, is very interesting. Um, in other, well, I'm just trying to think. I mean, I know, like in South America, in Peru, you know, they have the stones that you know fit right up against each other. And I'm mm -hmm. trying to recall if in Mesoamerica, I guess their rocks are mortared together. So, in any other American indigenous cultures, have we seen that kind of craftsmanship? Not that I'm... Well, there are various uh, stone forts uh, in the Indiana area and other parts of the Ohio Valley that, that uh, were made by... I'm going to just leave that blank for now. We may talk about that later, who may have built those. Uh, also in in Tennessee, uh, there are there are examples of stone, uh, even large stone structures, and and Native Americans weren't gen weren't generally credited with building from large stones. However, that's very much not the case. There are in the early accounts of archaeologists, there are numerous reports of stone forts and other stone structures. See, this is that whole cover up thing. Yeah, I just find that so fascinating. Well, um, it's okay. it's a thing. I mean, it's when the idea and it it first came about in the early 1800s, when uh, the idea of manifest destiny uh, was begun to be sold to the American public. Um, the idea that the European white man had uh, had a God given right to North America from the East Coast to the West Coast. Well, that's when they began to paint the picture of the uh, of the Native Americans as being savages and and having no uh, appreciable uh, civilization. So, throughout North America, you know, there's there have been sites, a lot of sites that were, you know, significant Native American sites 
have been built over, but that's where large cities are now, you know. Sad as that may be. Okay. Um. And, you know, the, of all the, I've been, this past summer, I, I spent a lot of time in, in the Northeast at uh, museums at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Princeton University Museum, and uh, the University of Pennsylvania Museum. And they all have tremendous collections of, uh, of, of Native American uh, artwork and, and artifacts that portray the Native American as far more advanced than general history does. However, in Manhattan, uh, right uh, near Wall Street, arguably the most valuable real estate on planet Earth, there's a very large, very beautiful building. It's the uh, uh, Museum of the American Indian. I've been there. I know. That place, it, it's the worst example of a, of a museum that I've come across. It's just a horrible museum. I hate to say that, but it is. <laughs> I mean, they have a lot of their stuff is from the early 1900s. Uh, and all of it, it's, it's the story that they're selling. And they're selling it on the most valuable piece of real estate in the world. Well, that's because they got it for like 25 bucks. Well, yeah. <laughs> it was a bargain. <laughs> it was a deal at the time, but they could get a lot of money for it now, too. And, uh, and that's the spot where they're continuing to sell the story that, ha that it, it, relieves, it relieves people of potential guilt. Well, one of the things that I think is interesting is, you know, when we think of the Americas, you know, North and South, Central and South America, you know, we always think of all of this monumental architecture happening, you know, in Mesoamerica or in South America. In the Americas, why don't we see that kind of structure, that kind of building? Was it a materials issue or was it because they weren't, you know, and I hate to say as advanced, but as advanced? Uh, a combination of the two. Okay. <laughs> and another thing, another, uh, another aspect is, is uh, why, why were the South American uh, indigenous people, why were they more advanced? Well, that's another chapter in the story. Uh, it's the idea of, of, of diffusionism, you know, the idea that ancient civilizations traveled and, and shared ideas far more extensively than history gives them credit for. Well, in this case, there's a overwhelming body of evidence that, uh, that among many others, uh, there were Egyptians, uh, North Africans, uh, Japanese, uh, all seem to, uh, to visit certain parts of uh, Peru and, and southern Mexico. I mean, I don't believe that the structures that we see in South America, in Cusco, in that area, Puma Punco, were at all recent. And I, I mean, that's my feeling, that they predate any culture going around the world, doing anything. My opinion. Yes, uh, it's, it's one of the mysteries of uh, mankind that I, you know, even those structures were the, the very large, very finely edged stone. Uh, there's no way, I, I can't offer a plausible explanation for that. And unfortunately, uh, accepted archaeologists and historians, they can't either. So mm -hmm. that's a big question mark. Now, something interesting that I have come about is, you know, when you start talking about a uh, you know, the time frames of things uh, as far as human occupation of the Americas. Well, I've come across, uh, there's, you know, when I was in elementary school, it was taught that, uh, you know, the uh, Asians came across the land bridge uh, into North America and settled, you know, from North America to South America. That was about 9,000 B.C. Um, however, there's a, a compelling case, and it's it's accepted by many academics that in Brazil there was a, uh, a burgeoning civilization that, that popped up around 50,000 BC and there's a very strong case for that. 
Um, <clears throat> now they were not from Asia. It appears that they were uh, they were Aboriginals, uh, probably from you know, Polynesia, but or uh, mm-hmm. so that's. Well, yeah, and I think that that concept is really interesting, and I love how it gets dismissed when they find evidence of foodstuffs that originated, you know, like in uh, Polynesia, uh, like sweet potatoes. I don't think sweet potatoes Mm -hmm. are indigenous to America, and some other things that they claim and support the concept that they are not uh, Asians, you know, even though there was an Asian influx. I mean, I do agree with that, but, you know, from what I understand, that was like one of the later influxes mm-hmm. and not one of the early ones. Yeah. Well, the uh, the idea of the sweet potato, that's suggestive that, that it was a, uh, that the... Uh, Polynesian islands, Easter Island, uh, other areas of there, were pe- were peopled by people from Peru, uh, because the sweet potato is indigenous to North, to South America, and oh, so it the other up, way around. It's the other way around. Yeah. That's so it's good. the sweet potato is evidence that the it was peopled from Peru, and it went uh, to the west. Mm-hmm. See, I know stuff, just sometimes not so accurate information. Yeah. <laughs> or, you That's know, part of the whole uh, the whole Thor Heyerdahl uh, mm-hmm. experiment, you know, where he was he was building these uh, ships and and boats based on ancient technology, and he was sailing. He, you know, he sailed from from uh, Iraq. He's down through uh, south. He sailed around Africa in in ancient uh, uh, Sumerian style ships, and then he sailed to the Mediterranean. From there, he sailed uh, using Egyptian ancient building technology. He successfully sailed to uh, to South America, and mm-hmm. then he went from South America. He built a, a ship uh, that sailed to uh, many thousands of miles to I forget the exact island, but he's one of the uh, uh, Polynesian islands. Well, didn't he also to, either go to Easter Island or come from Easter Island he, he did, in one he, of those he, boats? It, it, he had a he commissioned a study. He had, I think, he like contracted a large research vessel, and they had a good time. You know, it was like one of these. It wasn't in one of his, uh, you know, wooden craft. It was in a, a a nice ship that they went and studied Easter Island for a while. Uh huh. Yeah, I just find the whole thing interesting. One of the things you were talking about was a carved serpent, you know, and the car- the serpent in, um, well, I mean, there's the serpent mound in Ohio, you know, the serpent turns up obviously over and over again in uh, Mayan culture, you know, with the feathered serpent mm-hmm. and causal quotal. Do you yes. think that there's a relationship uh, one to the other? Uh, yes, I think there's a very distinct relationship. Um, you know, I never thought I would know how to spell the word Quetzalcoatl, but I can spell Quetzalcoatl now fairly easily because it it, it appears probably about a hundred times uh, throughout my book. So if that says anything. But this uh, <laughs> I'm not even going to make. A All right, yeah. I'll make a comment. You know, okay. I can spell it over and over and over again in my book, and still spell it wrong every single time. <laughs> it just seems to come flow right out now. I don't, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> anyway. So so that's kind of that whole story of the Brandywine Stone Wall. That uh, allowed me to meet another uh, a local university professor from Mississippi, Doctor Robert List. He and I kind of teamed up, and and he gave me some some uh, some old some literature that had uh, there were some uh, other accounts of odd structures in Mississippi that have that had not been researched until until now. There was okay. So me, before uh, you do that, so who is this Doctor List guy? What's his uh, background, credentials, whatever? He is a Yankee who moved to Mississippi. Hey, hey, yes. hey, he, he, uh, hey. <laughs> he is a uh, uh, a regular contributor to Ancient American magazine. He's he's also written several uh, several books. Uh, he's a professor of uh, 
at the universe, uh, Jackson State University here in Jackson, Mississippi. And um, okay. he's uh, he was I, you know I wish I could say these ideas you know were mine, but you know I was just kind of a I was kind of more of the uh, field work guy, and he was he was the one that uh, that was. He was as we were moving through these different locations. He was predicting what we would find, and uh, pretty much without fail, whatever he said we'd find, we found. And he was able to the things that I would just walk by. He could look at it and and he could make connections. So he's been instrumental, and I you know it, this stuff would never have happened without uh, his uh, his wealth of knowledge. And he's, well, he spent he spent twenty years traveling throughout uh, uh, Mexico, and he's been to many of the Olmec sites. He's very familiar with the Olmec culture, mm -hmm. and that's where we make a connection between uh, this the Brandywine Stonewall site. We find we found an artifact that, uh, in addition to the Quetzalcoatl nine foot long carved snake, we found a a, a celt an artifact that was identical to uh, to Olmec. Artifacts. So, what's a, a celt? Uh, it's a small stone uh, phallic symbol. Uh, it was something that they, an ancient would have held that would have uh, denoted his rank. Any mythology course, on that? I'm just well, curious. Other than it's it's a phallic symbol and well, you know, the large the phallic the, symbol. Yeah, you know, the, the bigger you know the, the bigger rank you were. Yeah, so um, and. And identical, uh, identically shaped celts uh, have been found at, at Olmec sites in southern well, see, Mexico. You know, contemporary society is so quick to say, oh, it's a phallic symbol. You know, but if you start looking at other mythological groups and the mm -hmm. iconography, you know, we have the lightning bolt, quote unquote, that Zeus carries, that mm -hmm. if you kind of morph it a little bit, you know... I guess could look like a phallic symbol, you know, if it just had rounded edges and anyway. So I'm just going to throw that out for you to think okay. about, you know. <laughs> um, um, well, you know, it's like, you know, everything is for ritualistic purposes, you know. So like that wall that you guys found was, was it for ritualistic purposes? Well, um, <laughs> it, I believe the I'm snake. I'm not laughing at you. I'm just yeah. laughing in general. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the snake, it, it appears that it very well could have been an altar of some kind. It's what it seems to be. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so that was that was one. That was the first site, and then we uh, we found the second site that was based on another piece of literature from the 1800s. Well, I, I want to go back to okay. the snake a minute. Okay. So, based on your observation, your belief is that the snake actually laid flat versus stood up and was some kind of a megalith marker kind of thing. Yes, it's it lays flat on the ground. Okay, just checking. Yeah. And if I could if I had the it's it's it weighs uh, several tons and if I could go uh get it I probably would. So but it's just too big to move right now. We'd like to preserve it. Um but it's just it's going to lay where it's at for now until some uh, better funded researchers can go in and study this place. But see, that's the thing. It's like, you know, you find stuff and no one digs, no one... You know, it, it, what it makes me think of is like Gobekli Tepe. You know, that, and I can't remember the archaeologist's name off the top of my head. Um, you know, but he saw some flint chips and knew that there was some kind of early culture there and started an excavation and bam, go back to Tepe. You know, mm -hmm. how do we know that we won't find something like that here? Yeah, well, we, uh, not far from where I live, uh, it was fairly recently a, uh, a, a regular citizen uh, found the oldest man-made structure in the Western Hemisphere. It's in Watson Brake, Louisiana, and it, it dates to uh, about 5,400 years ago, about 3,500 B.C., and it was, uh, it was found and uh, published, you know, articles were published by an amateur 
archaeologist. Her name was Risa Jones. Mm-hmm. And if it wasn't for amateurs out there, you know, a lot of the strides around here anyway wouldn't wouldn't be moving forward because except uh, some of the uh, scholars around here seem to be scared of some of this stuff. At least that's what I've encountered when I've tried to to share uh, the artifacts that we found with some of the university uh, archaeologists. They uh, it seems to scare them. Well, they don't know what to do with it because, you know, they didn't find it and it wasn't on their grant and blah, ah, blah, yes, blah, blah, yes, blah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah, blah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, it, you know, it's kind of like the Kensington Rune Stone. You know, it was found, it was unearthed, it traveled around, and now mm-hmm. it can't be real and it can't be something valid because... A certified archaeologist did not take it out of the ground during an ex- an expedition. Exactly. So. And it's the same case here. So. So um, okay, so we have the wall, which I wrote down the name, but I can't read my handwriting. So we'll mm-hmm. just say the wall, and we have the snake. So mm-hmm. what else was found in in the oh there it is in the Brandywine location. Okay, uh, there was, we found... Oh, and these, the phallic symbol. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we found clay, these clay cooking balls, which are a signature artifact of the Poverty Point culture, which was in this area. There's, there's, other, there's a, a much larger and actual location that's referred to as Poverty Point, Louisiana. And the people who live there are referred to as the people of the Poverty Point culture. And this is a, a fairly new uh, uh, addition to ancient history, this poverty point culture. The location in, which is not far, it's in Louisiana, and um, it was just recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And they've only really excavated about, I think, one quarter of one percent so far. And there are a lot of things there that uh, ring of an Egyptian influence at Poverty Point, Louisiana. Several things that, that are suggestive of, uh, of, you know, if nothing else, uh, an Egyptian uh, guidance and influence in the construction of the site and in, the, and in some of the artifacts that are found there. Where in Louisiana is, is this location that you're talking about? Is it in, like, northern Louisiana? Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's not close to anything in particular, but it's in it's near, if you wanted to look out on, on Google Maps, it's near Epps, Louisiana, E P P S, and it's uh, it's about maybe twenty miles from it's it connects it's on a, on a, a body of water that connects to the Mississippi River, and didn't and did in ancient times too. Okay. I'm just asking because I almost live in Louisiana now, oh, you know, so cool. I'm like, hey, well, you see, like you'll see this the little quick old buzz yeah, down the well, road. If, if you, you, you'll see this if you go on I-20 uh, towards Mississippi, about maybe 30 miles before you get to Mississippi, you would see a big sign that says Poverty Point Archaeological Site. And it's about a 15-minute drive north of there. So it's, and it's oh, open. Cool. They have an incredible museum. And some of the artifacts there are... Incredible. Incredible. I mean, they have some artifacts that were, uh, I mean, it appears that they were made on a, a precision metal lathe. You, 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 it's difficult to believe that these were uh, made by a civilization that supposedly was there 2000 to 1000 BC. That's when they, this group of people uh, occupied the area. Well, and they, we're gonna a, we're gonna put that in quote unquote. How's yeah. that? Okay. 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 But we have a dating question that just came up from Canoe, a new okay. visitor to the chat room, um, and he said many dates have been dropped very easily during this interview. Thirty four hundred BC, eight thousand BC. Uh, then I have to read this. Dendro chronology might be able to get dates like this, but carbon dating wouldn't. What method was used beside other people's research to gather these dates? Uh, I'm going to go with other people's research. Okay. Uh, and it's, you know, I don't, I don't, 
these are uh, I'm just gonna I'll be honest with you some of the it's comes from Wikipedia some of it so mm-hmm. you know it's it's what's in uh, the dates are typically Wikipedia is going to be where I get probably the majority of my dates and so you're not claiming to date this what your no. goal is it sounds like is to uh, bring this material to the population at large to go hey look there there's stuff yes. here yeah yeah we're standing on the backs of others here mm-hmm. but i mean as far as some of this the material that you're bringing forward i mean one of the things that i have noticed is that there was a lot more information exchange i mean we think about it now but it seems like people were much freer to uh, talk about things they find things they discover prior to 1940 and then something changed and it became very political and much more closed mouth Hmm. um you know and so i would think that any reports after the 1940s would be minimal but it sounds like this the newspaper articles that you've been finding all have predated yes you know that magic line in the sand Mm -hmm. and then it's a secret yes (laughs) Uh, so of the um, you know we were talking about the wall how much of the wall remains or do we even know how big that wall is or was Uh, it's there are outcroppings that cover an area several miles encompasses several miles but really the air we we focused on a very small segment of a of the structure and that's where you know we pulled out these artifacts and and some other things okay this is where it gets uh we take an an odd turn here uh next to this structure uh that appears to have been a hearth okay uh some type of it was a large stone hearth uh the stones on the stones that on the sides that are obviously placed by man at some point, uh, they're buried in the dirt very well, but they're replaced. There's burn marks on the stones, and we, uh, using metal detectors, just in one specific area, there's uh, we found buried iron right where there would be fire pits in this uh, structure. Which you know, according to uh, according to history, you know there was no uh, iron smelting in North America prior to Columbus. Mm-hmm. However, we find an overwhelming amount of evidence that that in fact it was occurring here at this one site. We also find scattered all over the property large amounts of chunks of iron slag, which would be the byproduct of refining iron it's and you would knock the the impurities that bubble to the top you would knock those off and you'd have a a, a bar of iron and we find that we find the slag in the area in large quantity okay so now i'm going to ask maybe the million dollar questions what were the native americans using the iron or do you think that one of these other groups that you were talking about earlier were coming here getting the iron, converting it into bars or whatever they would convert it into, and then hauling it back off. Uh, yes, the, the latter. A, a Mediterranean civilization. Uh, at, most likely, uh, based on some of the artifacts at the site, a, uh, an Egyptian operation, also uh, uh, an African presence, And they appear to have been based out of southern Mexico, uh, what's identified as as the Olmecs, you know, where where all these civilizations kind of came together and uh, and kind of morphed with each other. Uh, They appeared to have some kind of an an iron uh, production operation, where at least one of the sites in North America was in in Mississippi. There are other. ancient sites and further north that I've not personally visited, but there, there have been uh, a great deal of material published about where they were, uh, there's evidence of iron, iron refining in North America. 
Hmm. Okay. I mean, I think the Olmec are a very interesting culture, and, um, you know, the, I mean, my uh, interaction with them is mostly through their artwork, mm -hmm. and their artwork was phenomenal. And anything that really came after the Olmec period is just a cheap kind of knockoff imitation of something exquisite. Um my opinion. Yes. Um, that's obvious. I mean, it's <laughs> what anybody with a clear brain can see. You know, that's what it, it the Olmec culture popped up around 1500 BC from without having anything that really led up to it. They just, it just popped up with the giant carved stone heads that are quite obviously uh, genetically African. Okay, they to the even to the point where they have and they they wear the odd helmets. These are the eight foot tall stones that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. and uh, they have the the war helmets of the type that were of the type that were worn in Africa. And you know these these warriors had cornrows. They wore their hair in cornrows, an African hairstyle. So, however, conventional archaeologists uh, would argue that no, these were uh, indigenous. Uh, you know. Native Americans there, um, and and in fact, you know, during uh, uh, digs in the 1960s, uh, they record a cemetery in La Venta, Mexico, an Olmec site where they record uh, Africoid skeletons in the cemetery. So, you know, I don't know, I don't know how much evidence you need, but it's there, you know, and in, in, in stone carved in stone that can't be can't be washed away it's, it's hard to wash it away but they they try well and i was just thinking you know 1500 bc um was you know the time of the exodus and what what else was going on on the planet <clears throat> or in the more civilized cultures at that point in time you know, and did they have that level of art? And I guess they did. And so if it was brought in from somewhere else, it would make sense why they would be able to produce items that are exquisite. Yes. Um, well, that was 1500 B.C. And, I, and I'm just going to say that's, that's the accepted date for the Olmec culture. I'm going to suggest that it probably went back, you know, much farther than that. Okay. However... That's what they date these Olmec sites to that have no, you know, predecessor. That was that would have been at the end of the uh, the Bronze Age, towards the end of the Bronze Age in Europe, and at the dawning of the Iron Age. So that line in the sand is about 1200 BC. So we're talking a, the Bronze Age went in Europe from about 2500 BC to uh, <coughs> to the the dawn of the Iron Age, and there's. Um, there's another site in Mississippi that I'd like to talk about too. That is, to me, it's okay. the by far the most interesting site, and contains the most uh, the the most powerful evidence, and um, it connects to to the Bronze Age in Europe. Okay, and what site would that be? That's the it's the uh, the a location on the Pearl River. Uh, it's and it's where there's an assortment of stone. Stones uh, that the only thing on planet Earth that they match identically are stone anchors of the type uh, used in the me ancient Mediterranean. Um, there's, they match identically to stone anchors that were found off the coast of Israel, for example, and, and in other places. But these stones, they, they all have a uniform, there's three of them, uh, they all have a uniform five-inch hole near the center, and they have the same general shape of, of the stone anchors of the type used in the Mediterranean. And one of them has a carved tablet on the front of it. And um, that's where it gets very interesting. Uh, uh, you know, myself and Dr. List, we spent many, many hours on this carved tablet trying to kind of pull out of it what was, what it contained. And, uh, and I can tell you that in general, 
it resemble it, it matches uh, stone tablets of the type of of the Minoans uh, from the island of Crete. They were the Minoans were trading partners with the Egyptians, and they were the the copper merchants uh, of that era. So the stone, the tablet in that stone anchor uh, matches very closely uh, their style of artisanship. Now it was so faded that you know there were there were distinct designs in it, but we couldn't put them together because of the the surface was, so, was rough. And it was just the colors of the stone. It was hard for the human eye to, to put it all together. And that's when we were fortunate enough to, to be joined by a, uh, another member to the team, uh, Amy McDonald, who she's a local artist. And she found us through uh, just sheer uh, serendipity and, um, and determination on her part. She had, she had also kind of been on this quest. Um, so... She joined the team, and she spent uh, a great deal of time uh, with the stones and taking photographs using different techniques. And she came up with some sketches of just you know uh, a pencil on paper that depict. It's it's a lot easier to to understand the images after she gave it her treatment. And one is a distinct uh, Egyptian bird hieroglyph. That stands alone off to the side. Uh, in the middle other part of the tablet is uh, a, a boat that appears to have oars hanging off the side. And uh, an on another part of the stone tablet is, a, a, is what appears to be a, a double-bladed Minoan-style axe. And then there's some other some other designs that, that we just really can't put them together. You know, they could be uh, uh, reeds or you know some type of other plant life or something. But so it's you know the that continues to to you know continues to be studied. And um, so that's what's there. What's interesting is that the place where they were found, it was predicted evidence of this type would be found. Um, there's a, a theory that's been out there for, for probably a hundred years or so about in, uh, in the upper peninsula of Michigan, um, it's accepted archaeology that, that there was during ancient times, 3000 BC to about 1000 BC, that there were uh, open pit copper mines. And during that period of time, uh, it's been, uh, there are estimates of between half a billion pounds to a billion and a half pounds of copper. A very pure, high-grade copper was removed from the mines of uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I see, I think people have heard about that, yes. you know, remotely. Mm -hmm. So there was a question that was from way back, but now seems like an appropriate place to to toss it in. Um, have there been any finds of like shipwrecks? I mean, I know that it wouldn't be the same kind of a shipwreck um, that would support this seafaring metal grabbing culture? Uh, yes. Um, off the coast of Turkey, a, uh, a Minoan ship, it was caught, it's referred to as the Ulu Baroon shipwreck. Um, it was found, I believe, in the uh, early 80s by a sponge diver, and it contained uh, it contained these copper ingots that are referred to as oxides, and these copper ingots that were uh, removed from the shipwreck they they have characteristics of copper that would have come from North America. However, uh, these oxides have been studied, and they've never been... There's an isotopic uh, technique that can be used to determine their origin, and there, a lot of the copper that's uh, ingots that have been found, some of them they can trace to copper mines in, uh, in Africa or, or Europe, but they refuse to... 
they're not open to the concept to test them against North American copper. They refuse to do that. So it's impossible to make that connection unless you get a pure copper oxide and you give it an isotopic test versus North American copper. They, nobody will do that test. And it, first of all, you have to get one of these artifacts. And second of all, you have to have money to do that. And uh, those people that have those, both of those things refuse to consider the North American connection. So, yes, they have found that shipwreck. Um, there are other shipwrecks uh, that have been, that have been a, a, a Roman as well as, well as a, a Egyptian vessels uh, in, off the coast of Brazil, uh, off the coast of Venezuela, uh, off the coast of Massachusetts. And I just got a report a few days ago of, uh, of that off the coast of Florida, uh, St. Augustine, a in, an intact Russian, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Egyptian ship was found. It was laden with uh, uh, Mesoamerican uh, trade ware. And I'm kind of trying to put that story together right now. I think that would be kind of a, a smoking gun. That's, uh, you know, I, I just love how all of this is surprised because you're talking about this stuff and I'm like, really? Never heard of that. Really? Never heard of that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's out there. I mean, I'm not making anything up here. I'm, you know. Well, no, I know you're not making it up, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just, I mean, investigating Native, uh, you know, I'm more of a myth girl, philosophical girl than, you know, archaeology. I mean, I like archaeology, but anyway, <laughs> you know, I mean, you really like running out there and going into the field, you know, which I think is great. Because somebody has to do it and knock on doors and have it be important and stuff like that. Um, you know, but you were talking about the anchors uh, that were found. And I think that there were some anchors that were found, you know, off the East Coast as well. And I want to say that they were found, like, by Bimini. Um, you know, people yeah. try tying it to Atlantis and that whole thing. Yeah. Uh, there is that as well. Yes, I've seen those. Uh, however, I'm going to say that that the stone anchors at this site, they match identically in shape and size to the type that were used in, uh, in that era in, in the Mediterranean. And, and what, I'm going to be honest, the, some, some of the stone anchors that I've seen, they really don't look the same. So now kind of back to the, uh, the ancient copper trade theory that it was predicted that, that, uh, that this type of evidence would be found on this specific waterway in Mississippi because of the Mississippi connection uh, to, the, to this ancient copper theory, trade theory. On the Mississippi Gulf Coast, there are two archaeological sites side by side, and they're at the mouth of the Pearl River, which is where these stone anchors were found further north. And... Um, on these two archaeological sites, there were some some unusual findings there. I mean, they it's these were, you know, they they say that they were quote unquote poverty culture type sites because they do find artifacts from that era, the poverty point culture there. But they also have some other very unusual characteristics of just of just an you know a Native American site. They it appeared the archaeological reports uh, said that. The people who, it was two different cultures who occupied each of the two sites. They lived side by side. Two different cultures. It said they were foreigners who spoke a different language than the locals. Um, on these two sites, there, there were very long and deep hearths, burn pits. So they had a very large operation of some kind, some kind of factory where they were burning something. Uh, they had a like 100 meter long, you know, 100 meters of, of hearths on each of these two sites that are side by side. So um, it's been hypothesized that, that the copper uh, was taken to these sites and that's where it was melted into the, into the oxide molds. Uh, as far as evidence for that theory, they find a lot of these clay pieces that seem to have had have no usable purpose, and the suggestion is that these uh, 
clay pieces were, were forms for the oxides that they were poured into. Um, and like I said, one of the, uh, when they did it, they drilled into the core of one of the copper oxides that was found in the Mediterranean. Uh, it depicted characteristics of, <coughs> of copper that would have been poured under conditions like this. And it was poured in multiple pourings in a, uh, in a moist, wet environment. That's why it's called, uh, they refer to it as blister copper. And there's a lot of uh, cavities inside these, uh, inside these copper ingots. And it's to the point where if they're, they're actually kind of fragile. If you were to drop one, they say, it should they shatter? Because it's so porous. Hmm. And is it a mechanism of the technology of the day? Or was it more based on the less than stellar conditions that they were working under uh probably both you know they were under working under less than stellar conditions i mean they were had these fire pits going uh you know it's it's a mississippi is a fairly moist environment <laughs> um, and they were probably sweating <laughs> there, you know, well, there's a lot of water getting on these things not specific but it seems to fit uh it seems to fit the hypothesis here But see, that I, I just find that interesting. Any thoughts on who might have been doing all of the work? I mean, mining is not a simple operation. Smelting is not a simple operation. Do you think that if it was Mediterraneans coming here, that they were enslaving the natives? Or do you think they kept separate and just did their own business? Uh, it seems logical that they would have uh, enslaved the locals or, or somehow uh, procured their labor, most likely under slave circumstances, though. Is there any, um, you know, you talked about them living in near, um, you know, in an in a encampment near there, um, but there isn't any references to being put under into labor or anything like that? You know, referring back to the mining operations? Uh, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of you know, any legends of, uh, of slavery. You know, it's it falls outside of the evidence that I've seen. Okay. Uh, we have a question from somebody that's not in the chat room, uh, Mark. And he wanted to know if there were any reports of these people being giants. Uh, no. I'm not. I don't I haven't come across a giant connection here. Okay. That I, that I personally that I personally come across. I I'm, I'm, There does seem to have been a uh, uh, a group of giants that lived throughout the Americas. There's a lot of evidence for that, but I just it, it doesn't really play into this particular uh, story here. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that I know that is all over the Mississippi, Ohio Valley are mounds. And, you know, you've been talking about these rock formations, but where these rock formations have been found, is there also a mound culture associated with it? Uh, there, there is a mound culture, and it was, uh, like I said, the, uh, the, the Poverty Point uh, site, which, and I did mention earlier that they were, you know, it depicts evidence of, uh, of Egyptian influence. And they have a, a very large, very, very large mound there that is called uh, the Bird Mound. It's Mound A on the site. And it's, uh, it depicts a very large bird of some kind, which it's been suggested it could be uh, in, you know, a symbol for Horus, the Egyptian uh, bird deity. Um, uh, you know, another thing at, at Poverty Point is that it's, it's a series of concentric rings that covers a mile about a, a, almost one mile across and this series of concentric rings uh, it matches uh, you know Egyptian style of, of, a, of a board game it's called Mayhem and it was a game that was played in Egypt and throughout uh, throughout the Mediterranean in an ancient area and they also find at the Poverty Point site these clay artifacts that they look like they were dice uh, or they were look like they were some other type of game pieces. So 
was hypothesized that this was some type of a, uh, you know, I don't know, a place where they were in addition to, they also find tra traces of copper, you know, large traces of copper. So somehow the, the Poverty Point site in Louisiana tied into the copper trade. Uh, and it may have been a, 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 a you know, someplace uh, where they stopped and, and rested for a while or something. But um, another another signature of uh, Egyptian influence is the, the figures, the clay figures that they find there are, uh, they have a cleft head, which is, uh, you know, it's... Oh, um... <laughs> I am not paying attention to the time, but we need to go to break. So, um, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. We're talking to Brandon Hurd about his book, Ancient Mississippi. And we will be back with Brandon after these words from our sponsors. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Louise. And thank you all for staying tuned to the second hour of the show. This hour of the show is brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics, where you can jumpstart your intuition today by downloading our free 50-page guide. And for the month of October, you can actually start learning to become a certified medical intuitive, intuitive counselor, or certified energy medicine practitioner, all from the comfort of your home. All of our training programs are 30% off. Check them out, AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. Also brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer. Uh, don't forget, get your copy of ET Chronicles and Icon, Deconstructing the Archetypes of Our Ancient, both available on Amazon.com, both discounted. Get them, please, because they're mine, and you guys like me a little bit. At least that's what some people tell me. Anyway, so we've been talking to Brandon Hurd about his book, Ancient Mississippi. And Brandon, um, I meant to mention this before the break, and I forgot that you also have a Facebook page that's called Ancient Mississippi, and why don't you just spend a couple of seconds telling people what you actually put on that page? Because I know that you have a lot of information that you actually post there to share with people. Okay, um, that's a page uh, where I'm where I highlight and I, I reveal a lot of the photographs and and uh, I try and make it in short bullet format where I don't try and overwhelm somebody with all this information. But I believe that a picture can tell a thousand word is worth a thousand words. And uh, there's a, I try and put together the the photographs and images in a way that kind of tell the story without you know having to read too much. So it's easily to easy to digest. And uh, in addition to uh, to my research, uh, several other uh, authors and researchers have begun to contribute uh, a, a wealth of just very interesting related subject matter. And it's also, uh, you know, it's where I've I've had several people contact me through this uh, Facebook group, and uh, and have shared with me some some of their finds, you know, that they some artifacts that they've found that they don't know what to do with, you know, that that are artifacts in this in this vein, you know, they fall outside of accepted history. So, and whenever whenever I get that, I try and run those to the ground as best I can. <laughs> <laughs> or put them in touch with somebody who's, you know, maybe better qualified. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. so when we when we left off, we were talking about, um, you know, some of the mining and copper that has been uh, excavated from around the country. Is there any other kind of evidence of other cultures um, coming to the Americas that we don't really hear about? Uh, definitely. Um, there are, you know, as far as, you know, once again, the, the Mediterranean cultures, uh, that were, you know, th there's, you could write an encyclopedia on the artifacts that have, uh, that appear to suggest a connection. Okay. Uh, the multiple shipwrecks, you know, throughout the coastlines of North and South America that I talked about earlier. Um, but there's some other things. I mean, some other, uh, agricultural, uh, things that, that show up. Uh, for example, back in the mid-70s, uh, you know, they find, they begin to find nicotine in, uh, in mummies. It, 
and nicotine because from tobacco, which is from the Americas. They really didn't have nicotine in the, in the old world. Uh, in addition, they find uh, cocaine residue in a large number of uh, mummies. So I guess they have all also, the good stuff here in America. Yes, all the good stuff. Well, they took it back. <laughs> That's what they were, you know, they, they came and got what they didn't have. Um, also, uh, North American uh, corn of the type grown in the Americas shows up in in artwork where they allegedly didn't have uh, North American corn in in Egypt, but it shows up in their artwork. Well, you know, I was just, okay, I'm really kind of geeky, and I've been reading uh, the Old Testament again. Uh, actually, I'm working on a bunch of articles, and so I needed to reference, and so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to read the Torah again and, and get my material. And one of the things that they were talking about was um, about corn, you know, <laughs> Moses and corn and something. And I have written a piece, actually it was published in Ancient America, um, about the evolution and development of corn in the Americas. And <laughs> corn is an indigenous crop to the Americas. And so how could they have had it? In Egypt, and actually that was something I was going to start to run down myself. How could they have had it in Egypt by Moses' time if there wasn't some kind of a connection back then? Correct. And, you know, when you talk about Moses' time, it's, uh, I think it's many, it's hard to put an exact date on that, but uh, it's generally accepted that it was around 1450 B.C., which... Incidentally, is the time uh, that that the Minoan culture, who appears to have been involved in this north uh, global copper trade, that's when their civilization began to decline uh, because they were uh, a significant portion of their island was devastated by a tsunami uh, from a, a nearby uh, volcanic island blew up. And it struck the island of Crete so bad that it seemed to set their set, set the Minoans back. Uh, you know, and almost it caused their culture to then go into decline. Um, so that's kind of about the time frame that it appears that this industry began to taper off. Was about this the era of Moses. And if if you speaking of the Bible, if you look at the uh, the Exodus, many of the things. Uh, uh, the uh, can be explained as a result of uh, of you know natural disaster. Uh, all the, the most of the plagues uh, that were set upon Egypt could be explained by uh, by environmental disruptions. Uh, the locusts, the frogs, uh, the the water turning to blood. Uh, some of the others escape me right now, but it seems plausible that many of these could be explained by by. Uh, uh, ecological disaster nearby. Also, mm -hmm. as Moses began to go, uh, they began to go towards uh, the the promised land, Israel. They f at night they followed pillars of fire. Well, that sounds no like no extraterrestrial connection there. No, no, there's pillars of fire. Well, I'm saying it, it sounds like it could have been uh, uh, a volcanic event. You know, uh, a volcanic which was to the north of them. I mean, it was out in the Mediterranean, the island of Crete. Uh, it Very likely, you know, it could have gone high enough to where it would have been a, a fire in the sky. So are you trying to time. tie Exodus to the explosion at Santorini? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. Seems plausible, so. I mean, um, and I think it's a very interesting theory, yeah. you know, and... Just as long as you don't like call it Atlantis, you know, which some yeah. people want to well, do. Some people do. Some people do. I know yeah. some people do. Yeah. And, uh, to, you know, you mentioned Atlantis. Uh, uh, as far as the story of the, uh, the most compelling uh, uh, account of this, the, the best case for this global copper trade is put out in a book by, by Gavin Menzies, uh, a very uh, – a book – not written for academics. It's written for a, a more general readership, such as myself. 
and it it makes it all very easy to digest in a non-academic way, which most of the stuff that we, that we deal with here is, is put out in an academic format, which is slightly more difficult to digest than how Gavin Menzies does it. Now, his book was, uh, uh, I know Atlantis was in the title, but he, he, the case that he lays out, it's very, very, very compelling. And he was a, uh, a uh, he was in the Royal Navy. He was a, a submarine commander for the majority of his career. And he has made the voyage, you know, across the Atlantic quite a few times. And he's very familiar with one of the things that he brought to the uh, to the table with his accounts uh, was a, a very strong knowledge of, of ancient seamanship and of currents. And, and he explains it very plausibly uh, how, you know, the, the Minoans, how, you know, their, their artwork, their frescoes that they've excav excavated depicts, you know, very large multi-masted ships that would have been very capable of, uh, of making this voyage. And then he makes the case, you know, of where, you know, the, the Minoan, this, this shipwreck, this Minoan shipwreck that was found off the coast of Turkey, it had, it had trade items from, from five continents, five different continents. You know, they had Baltic amber. They had uh, I, I, African ivory. Uh, and other things, uh, North American copper. So, um, so the the case of that it was the Minoans who who were known uh, in that era as the copper uh, copper traders in charge of the copper industry. Um, you know, and it, the reason why perhaps it's not. Well, f first of all, we didn't really know about the Minoans until the early 1900s. That's when they were first rediscovered, okay, on the island of Crete. And the extent of their civilization was really not known until fairly recently. So, as far as their uh, uh, expeditions to the Americas, well, bronze, which is uh, nine parts copper to one part tin, the tin probably came from England because there's they find Minoan evidence in England. Uh, it was technology of its era. And so they would have they wouldn't this is not something that they would have shared uh, where they were getting this these large quantities of of very, very pure copper. This would have been, you know, a classified military operation. Because if you had if you had bronze weapons, and the kingdom next year's had stone weapons, or if they had copper weapons, you could easily annihilate them. You would win the battles. So that was that little bit of technology that would give your military a superior uh, position on the battlefield. So they, and it's just like now, if we're not going to reveal the source of our military technology, we're going to keep it a secret. So that's why it wasn't necessarily widely known. Um, but so that's the Minoan copper trade. But there's, there's evidence of other in North America specifically. Um, there have been several uh, Egyptian artifacts found. Uh, there was one uh, there's been a uh, an Egyptian, a clearly Egyptian statue that was found in uh, in Libertyville, Illinois. I mean, it's you know, it's it appears to be a distinctly um, Egyptian artifact. So there's also been a very distinctly Egyptian uh, statues found in in El Salvador, as well as. Here in, in Jackson, Mississippi, and we have a world-class collection of, uh, of South and Central American artifacts. And some of those depict characteristics, distinct characteristics of, uh, of Egyptian influence. There, there's a, a figure that has a Nefertiti hat. It was found in Mexico. 
and it's here in my local museum. Um, so, and, and the style of Nefertiti hat, it's, it appears, it's not uncommon in, uh, in uh, certain types of uh, Mexican cultures. And, and was that a traditional kind of headdress? Um, well, I think it was a, a ceremonial. It, it, was, it appears that it was something very important, and it appears uh, on high-quality, important figure, figures, clay figures. It was something they were wanting to, to, to memor, memor, memorialize. Was, uh, was these Egyptians were, were something they wanted to record. You know, that their presence was something they wanted, that was something important to them, and they wanted to, uh, to leave a record of it. And that's how they did it. They did it in, in works. <clears throat> so, I mean, the... Uh, um, one of the things that you talk about in your book, Ancient Mississippi, is about coins that were found. Could you talk yes. about that a little bit? Because I well, think, start. you know, when we when we go and dig around and you find a coin, I mean, it's kind of like a time stamp, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And it also uh, kind of depends on, on how it was found and where it was found, how deep it was found. Was it found in a, uh, you know, in, a, in an Indian mound, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and um, I'm sorry, but there have been... Uh, at least 10 that I'm aware of, um, very likely many more, and there's certainly many more that have not been found, but there have been at least 10 uh, old world uh, coins uh, found throughout the southern U central U.S. And uh, these coins have been studied, they've been determined by academics to be legitimate coins from uh, Many of them appear to have originated from Carthage, uh, uh, circa 400 A.D. So that timeline doesn't necessarily line up with the Minoan theory, but it does line up with a, a later, uh, later visitations to the. But Americas. you know, when when you find things like that, it makes you think that scholars think that we're running around, and I have this. Egyptian coin, and I'm just going to toss it on the ground. I mean, really? Really? Well, they, their argument is that it's coin collectors who have just lost these coins. Really? Yes. I mean, come on. And, and I can argue that if, if you had found one, it's pretty plausible that, you know, birds could have carried it, you know, fish could have eaten it and swam over here. That's plausible for one, maybe two. But they're finding these coins and other Roman-style artifacts uh, along specific waterways, specifically the Ohio River Valley and the Ohio River. That's where they find these, these uh, Old World coins and, and other, uh, other metal artifacts that, that may have been uh, Roman in origin. Now, there's another very, very sound uh, uh, theory out there by uh, a fellow researcher, Rick Osmond, that, uh, that the Roman Ninth Legion came to the Americas. Uh, they kind of disappeared from history under kind of mysterious circumstances. They seem to have dropped off the, uh, dropped off the radar, I believe, about 300 uh, 300 A.D. And they just kind of, they were a very notable fighting force up until a certain point, and then they just vanished. And uh, it's it's been theorized that they came to the Americas for some reason. And uh, I believe I mentioned earlier that, that there are some stone structures uh, throughout Indiana and Tennessee that... Um, that are built in a fashion that's uh, very much in line with Roman military uh, structures, uh, specifically signal towers. And they find other artifacts that they were that they were 
had built a series of signal towers throughout uh, uh, the, Ohio, the Ohio Valley. And they also find some metal, some, some Roman metal artifacts. So there's that mm -hmm. you know, era of visitation. Um, and there's also uh, appears that there was a, a Celtic uh, presence in in North America and possibly South America as well. But uh, in recently or now in in West Virginia, there's a another fellow researcher, uh, Yoli Molina, who she has uh, found some incredible uh, uh, car stone carvings that are. <sighs> They match identically to to Celtic stone carvings uh, found in, in northern France and in in Germany and in England, and in, well, northern France and in England. And it's it's they're exactly the same. Uh, and they find these alongside uh, Ogham writing, which is uh, a Celtic ancient Celtic style of writing that people of that era would have, would have left. And, uh, and, so, and so the Celtics are not the same as the Viking group that we pretty much only ever hear about. Yes, correct. It's a different group. And it would have been uh, very likely an, 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 earlier, uh, an earlier visitation. You know, and I uh, saw some TV show that was talking about that there was actually a Jewish presence here in the yes. United States, too. What's with that? Yes. That, that evidence is, once again, uh, uh, overwhelming. Uh, if, you, if you would, and I have a feature on it on my Facebook group, there's the, the, the Bat Creek Stone, which uh, has become recognized as a legitimate artifact, uh, and it depicts, uh, it's, it can... It was found, I believe, in 1872, and um, it sat for 60 plus years in the uh, in a museum. And they thought it was it, the writing that was on it. They just thought, oh, that's just some Cherokee symbols. Well, uh, a researcher uh, in the 40s took another look at the artifact, turned it upside down, and realized that it was uh, an early form of Hebrew writing. So it went for if it was a uh, if this was a hoax, it wasn't a very good hoax, okay, by the alleged <laughs> perpetrator. Um, and you know it's funny how the, the academics have gone after the the guy who found it. You know they've just attacked his uh, his integrity. Uh, you know made him out to be a lot of things, but but uh, another uh, gentleman who has, has studied the artifact very deeply. You know, he he's found out that this this guy later served as a, a he was a, a a Civil War veteran. You know, he was injured Civil War veteran who later was elected to to some high offices in the county that he lived in. So he wasn't that bad of a character. Whereas historians and you know the academics have have launched in and attacked his uh, integrity. So this Bat Creek Stone, uh, which has been highly studied, it's it's it was found in a uh, in a in, in uh, an Indian mound. Uh, there's also uh, a, and it's in Ohio. It's an earthwork. Oddly enough, it's called, and it it's also on my Facebook site. But the uh, the early uh, architect uh, archaeological drawing of this earthwork. If you look at it. You don't believe it because it's it's clearly a, a, a Jewish menorah with a with a lamp at the top of it. That's what it clearly is, and this is an earthwork in Ohio. <clears throat> so, why were Native Americans uh, uh, way before Columbus? Why were they creating earthworks that depicted menorahs and and uh, Middle Eastern style lamps? Now, oddly enough, this, this ties to uh, a period in uh, in Jewish history where uh, the exact uh, war eludes me right now. But there there were uh, uh, 
actually two waves, it appears, of Jewish migration to the Americas. And it was as a result of, of times that they were, uh, you know, being fight, fighting large wars. I mean, they, they, they were refugees that were showing up on the shores of America. And they were building, you know, they had these artifacts. They had these uh, uh, Middle Eastern style lamps that are, that are found, you know. So R.W. has a question, and he wants to know um, if you know anything about Little Egypt in Illinois? Yeah, you know, I've looked into that, and there's there's also, like here in, in Mississippi, um, we've got it, Egyptian place names. And kind of, I kind of hit a wall with that. It was, it, you know, it appears that that the, a lot of these towns were named uh, in, during a, an era where, you know, religion was a, a, an important part. Of, a, of the vernacular and um, you know a popular story was uh, Egypt was a common theme so I think that a lot of these places were named because of maybe how that city or how that region how it kind of like was similar to to a biblical an area an area in the Bible so I think they're more Bible names rather than Specifically, names for uh, that were you know as as left over from uh, uh, you know earlier occupations, earlier visitations. I think it's just kind of a more of a modern tradition. All right, there was another question, and now I'm trying to find it. Okay, and actually, I've had two people make a comment about this about. Um, do you know anything about the Chinese people? So not the Siberian wave that we yes. all know about, but the about Chinese coming to North America in the BCs. Uh, yes, uh, and that's more of the I'm I'm familiar with that story. Uh, also, uh, Gavin Menzies, he is the uh, he's probably the most prolific uh, researcher on that particular vein. Uh, um, but yeah, he makes a, a very compelling case of uh, of, a, of a Chinese uh, visitation to one degree or another to the Americas. I mean, they had the, they had massive uh, massive sailing vessels, and there uh, there are artistic. Oh, I mean, there are some the art. There's artistic uh, Asian signatures left behind in in a variety of artifacts. Uh, some of those, some of those I, I highlight uh, on the, my Facebook member group. Artifacts that they look like, if, if I, it's a surprise when you look at them, when I tell you that they came from Mexico. You think, no, these, these are not Mexican things. These are clearly Asian, so. Yes, there, uh, yeah, there was a, a definite uh, Asian Connect. But it doesn't seem like in any of these groups that they came here with the understanding that they were going to stay. Because it doesn't seem yeah. like any of their technology really came with them other than these very small fragments. Unless, and I will throw in an unless, it's all buried and has yet to be uncovered. Yeah, I mean that's well, that's characteristic of North America. If you, uh, especially for example here in Mississippi, you know, if you go, uh, if I build a house in the woods, and I, I leave it alone for ten years, uh, I'm going to come back in ten years, and there's going to be trees growing up through it. So, uh, and you know, earthworms uh, creating mat material that's going to, it's this things are going to sink. You know, they're going to disappear. Unless they were constructed in the 21st century, and then they'll yeah. just stay for forever. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, some of these artifacts, some of these things, for example, the Olmec statues. Uh, you know, it, of what of what you're around every day, 3,500 years from now, how much of that's still going to be there? You know? Well, I mean, some of that material is so hard that... Yeah. I wouldn't doubt that it would still be here. You know, well, it'll still happen. be here, but it'll be uh, it will have been worked into the ground. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unlike sure. a McDonald's drink cup. 
It, well, it could be worked very deep in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll still be recognizable still, and the graphics but, won't even have worn off. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think that there was necessarily a McDonald's cups, you know, 1500 B.C., but, you know. Well, no, um, but I, yeah, you know, yeah. I always conjecture, you know, 5,000 <laughs> years down the road and archaeologists are, you know, uncovering some area and they find this cup with the god to the golden arches or this <laughs> female goddess figure wendy uh -huh, because of yeah. all of these ritualistic cups yeah. that are used you know to honor her <laughs> and and it uh -huh. <laughs> all sarcasm intended uh, <laughs> starbucks the starbucks uh but see Spider all of theirs are paper Oh, yeah, okay. You know what I mean? McDonald's and all the fast food, they're all plastic. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of them have gone to styrofoam, so that might be a little more biodegradable. But, you know, that hard plastic, that ain't going anywhere for a long time. Canopic mm -hmm. <laughs> jars. They make would make a great canopic jar. Uh, <laughs> so one of the sites, you know, when I was going through your book, something that really intrigued me, and I'd like to have a little conversation about this, was a discovery, and I, I didn't write down which site, of uh, clay pyramids. Um, well, it was a clay structure. A, a, a floor is a more accurate okay, description of this thing. And uh, it's, it came out of a, uh, uh, a journal that dated to 1872, and it gave a rough location to the place that uh, it, it took uh, knocking on a few doors and asking if anybody was familiar with this place. And it turned up pretty quick. But once I arrived there, it, it matched identically to the description uh, in the, the 1872 description. And what it, at, at that time, they described it as a, a clay uh, floor that emerged when they began to... Uh, remove three feet of earth in this one particular area of Mississippi. Okay, so, and that's but that's what was there. There was, you know, uh, a, a level of earth, three feet above it, you know, with trees on it and everything. And then this, and there was this clay, uh, obviously man-made uh, floor. Um, that it was, it, it, it had areas where it was obviously worked, okay? Like it had a lip. It had a lip on one side. So, and it also had a, uh, it also had a, a, an art, an artistic rendering of some kind. It, it has been exposed and it has been driven over for over a hundred, you know, for a long time now. They integrated into part of a rural road. So, but it's not driven over very much, but it's, it's part of a road. And so it has begun to crack, and it's not like it was uh, in 1872. But it is still obviously man-made. Uh, it also contains, it's loaded up with, I've never seen anything like this, but it uh, has large chunks of iron ore, or perhaps iron ore, that are that are all around it, which is very unusual. So, uh, it's you know, Doctor List and, and myself, we hypothesize it's near a body of water, and, and we're, the hypothesis is this was perhaps a, a, a loading dock for the uh, for the iron uh, operation because uh, it's next next to a, it's not very far from the Brainy Wine Stone Wall. It's connected by a waterway. And it goes to uh, a larger waterway. So, you know. Okay, so that wasn't really what I was talking about, oh, but that is pretty interesting. So yeah. the one that I was, because I, I just opened your book and found oh. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, I'm going to find the, the reference. Uh, okay. This was the clay pyramids at Jake's Town. Okay, Jake, Jake Town, yes. Jake Town. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, and the reason that I bring it up is that, well, let me hear what you have to say, and then I'll throw out my little blurb on it. 
And the, okay. and the part that I'm the most curious about are the shape pieces that look like pyramids. Yes. Pyramids. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Those are, uh, and I found something out recently about that, but that, that shape uh, and you're going to have to remind me, there's a, a term I use to describe the shape. It's not... Uh, tetrahedron. Tetrahedron. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, Jake Town. Uh, it's, once again, it's a, it's a very... It predates Poverty Point, okay? But it's a Native American site that... Uh, uh, it's a predecessor to the pro Poverty Point culture. Later, it was occupied by the Poverty Point culture, but uh, it's older than... The poverty point site, and uh, like I said, Doctor List and myself were in the area. We just kept, we're knocking on doors of people that live near the place, and uh, this one lady pulls out. It's a clay ball, and it has a uh, a rough clay ball, and it has a a very finely polished clay uh, pipe that fits perfectly through the clay ball. You know, what that tells me is they were doing something there at very high temperatures, whether that was uh, 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 a kiln for ceramics or perhaps a, uh, uh, a crude, a crude uh, iron refining operation there. They, do, they, they did have artifacts that come from there. They call them uh, plummets that, to a layman such as myself, they appear to have been made of uh, crude crude iron ore. They look very, they're very fine objects uh, and they're very, very heavy. They're made, they, the term that the archaeologist uses is heavy iron ore. Okay? I use okay. crudely refined iron, okay? Because it it appears to be like iron to me. <laughs> and um, so they, they, this is what Poverty Point was known for, was for these plummets. Now, uh, the tetrahedrons, uh, they are found in, in uh, in quantity, and they have some there at a little museum, but they're these little pyram pyramidal, uh, anywhere from, you know, like two inches tall, roughly. Um, but they find them in number there, and they, they were written about. as far they, they don't know what their purpose was, uh, so really it's speculation, but what they could have been used for is uh, for, uh, for, you know, maybe it's flux for a furnace, uh, to help a furnace come to you know high temperatures, uh, these were these were you know fired clay artifacts. They were they were they had been taken to very high temperature. Uh, they said because of the color, they were like almost white. So so there's that potential. You know, there's also the potential that I mean these were these artifacts were from the most ancient sites, uh, the most ancient civilization in North America. And there is a, a, you know, the idea of a geometric uh, uh, you know, that would have that, that had a very significant that's a very significant shape uh, for the you know, for that realm, that school of thought so that could have played a role so we really don't know what they were but they're very interesting and, and I would like to know, you know, some be interesting to study them further no doubt. Well, what I find interesting is that they have actually found other pyramidal items in mm. the Americas and mm. in Bosnia, by the mm. Bosnian pyramid, mm. and they were carved. You know, they were actually carved and had like little lines on them like, mm. you know, a regular pyramid, you would think. Now, finding something like that, in my, or in, in my expert opinion, um, you know, finding something like that in Bosnia would maybe make sense because there is the potentiality that, you know, someone actually saw the pyramids mm -hmm. and, you know, made a copy of it. Exactly. But in the Americas, to find a straight-sided pyramid, mm -hmm. there is no exemplar. Yes. You know, because all of the pyramids, minus the ones that are in Egypt, on the Giza Plateau, mm -hmm. all are step pyramids. Yeah. Well, and Nubia. I mean, there's there, that is the uh, exception to the rule 
versus the rule. But mm-hmm. why would you find pyramids in the Americas with straight sides if there are no straight-sided pyramids in the Americas? Yeah. You know, once again, just another piece of the puzzle, maybe, you know? Yeah, I don't know. And what an incredible puzzle it is. Um, so, you know, we, anyway, anyway so I want to kind of go back and kind of reach somewhat further back. You know, okay. I, I want to look at who, who the, the question of who the earliest humans in, in the Mississippi area were. And, uh, you know, I was doing the research and the oldest, you know, uh, date that I could find affixed to an artifact found in Mississippi was uh, they was 10,000 BC and it's uh, some Clovis points, some spearheads, Clovis spearheads. So I said, okay, well these the, the Clovis people were perhaps the first humans in Mississippi. And uh, well, actually one of the dates is the accepted date back then. This is a very a, a artifact found back in the 70s. But, the, but they put 10,000 B.C. on it, which was probably very controversial at the time. But if you begin to kind of study this whole the Clovis culture uh, uh, hypothesis, what's begun to emerge is if you follow that style of stone uh, technology or craftsmanship, that trail goes back to... Uh, Across the Atlantic Ocean, to the to to Europe, specifically to uh, to France, where on that side of the ocean they they're Lutrians. They made stone tools in a very 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 similar fashion than than the Clovis people did. And those they find those artifacts up through Greenland, okay, up over into Europe. However, uh, if you Try to follow that same stone evidence. Um, if, you, if you try to find it, follow it up to Alaska, it begins to go cold in Alaska, and it goes completely cold once you cross uh, cross the Bering Strait into uh, uh, Siberia. That that t- it disappears. That style of stone craftsmanship does not exist in Siberia. They have a completely di- different stone tool. Uh, methodology. They use small, very small uh, blades that were Im- embedded into to bone. Okay, so a completely different technology once you cross the Bering Strait. So, um, so it's it's becoming to be accepted um, that you know, one of the proponents is a, a, a an archaeologist, Dennis Stanford uh, of Smithsonian. And, uh, and also another gentleman, Bruce Bradley from the University of Exeter, they have been the proponents of this theory. And one of the dates that they seem to kind of bandy about is uh, about 25,000 B.C. for this uh, from this migration of some type from, from Europe to the Americas. So this 25,000 year time frame uh, uh, predates, you know, the Asian, and certainly, you know, uh, the the current Native Americans, and there's a distinct Asian uh, genetic influence there, uh, but it's, it's, they are obviously somewhat different than Asians. Okay, there's another, it's been a blend. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a blend there. There's no, they don't look specifically Asian. They look like a blend. <coughs> and, um, and specifically, you know, I mean, the uh, uh, Cherokees look look more uh, they look more European than than the type of Native American that you would find uh, as an Alaskan. Let's say an Alaskan is going to look very Asian. Uh, uh, a Native American from the West, he's going to look as you, as you move to the East. Uh, the Native Americans, they they, you know, when they were first. Uh, uh, encountered Europeans, they looked much less Asian. So, anyway, now what appears happened uh, to this first wave of civilization that came to the Americas about 
10,000 BC, there was a massive cometary event uh, in the uh, eastern U.S. It, it hit there very hard, and um, it also in Europe. But uh, um, and it's evidenced by there's a, a layer of micro diamonds that you'll find when they when they excavate these sites and they find these Clovis artifacts. Um, there's a layer of micro diamonds on top of the artifacts, but not directly it, under them. So is that part of the Carolina Bay? Carolina impact? Bay, yes. Car that is certainly a, the Carolina Bays were. Yes, this particular cometary event helped create some of the Carolina Bays. Some of them are older, okay, but some of the Carolina Bays were this, okay, and that set back the the Clovis slash Seleucid people to where they were probably uh, either wiped out or, or reduced to the point where the Asians sort of assimilated them. And so do you think that, um, you know, because there's a lot of people that talk about um, things that happened around 10,000 B.C., you know, the end of the woolly mammoth and the mm -hmm. other giant yeah. uh, mammal creatures that were all over the planet. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this Carolina Bay's impact was responsible for a global catastrophe, not just a local catastrophe? It would appear so. Yeah, it would appear so. That it was a uh, yeah a significant event uh, that you know it hit in it hit in certain areas worse than others. But you know they have found uh, uh, mastodon remains with with uh, meteorite fragments embedded in them, as well as human remains with meteorite fragments embedded in them that date to this era. Hmm. Okay. Um. So what do you think caused, because it seems like um, when Westerners came to the Americas, they're, you know, and I, I might be talking out of a totally biased comment, but it, it appears as if the level of culture and civilization that they did find had declined from something that was at a much higher level. Yes. Um, do you have any thoughts on why these cultures did decline? Okay. Um, well, let's, you got let's look at the accounts from uh, from De Soto's historian, who would have been the first European to encounter Native Americans, and De Soto's historian uh, describes a far, far more advanced indigenous people. Uh, uh, he describes. Um, they had furniture covered in tapestry. They had tapestries hanging on their walls. They had uh, uh, houses with walls around them, with you know, walls around the houses. They had quote unquote churches with steeples. Um, they had uh, large, uh, regularly surveyed farms. Uh, they traveled in in bar in large in royal barges, um, and they had kings and queens that governed very large areas. Hmm. Uh, these are the words of Desoto's historian. So, now what likely happened from okay. from that encounter we, we, is a hundred right. years. Mm -hmm. Okay, very quick though, very quick because okay. we need to wrap up. All right, okay. actually, really need to go. It so, if somebody <laughs> say that again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. End of story. Okay. Get the book. That's what you yeah. just say. Get there the book. Go. Get the book. Um, so if somebody wants to get a copy of your book, Ancient Mississippian, where where is the best place to send them? Uh, Amazon.com. Just type in Ancient Mississippi or, or my name, Brandon Hurd. Well, okay. Hey, Brandon, thanks for coming on the show and enlightening people to all of the stuff that is, you know, right in their own backyard that they don't even know about. Yep. Well, thanks for having me. It's well, been a pleasure to, uh, to share, you know, uh, it's about to turn into a passion for me. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. Keep it up, you know, keep yeah. knocking on doors because well, that's to, uh, just really cool. Yeah. We've only just begun here. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go and I will talk to you again soon. All right. Thank you. All right.
great things. Hey, bye bye. That's Brandon Hurd. His book is Ancient Mississippi. You can like his page on Facebook, which is Ancient Mississippi, which has all kinds of pictures and great stuff. Um, and then next week, we have Jennifer O'Neill coming on to talk about energy vampires. And then Rick Delano coming on talking about geocentrism. What is it? I don't know. Tune in next week and find out. And so until then, I'm Dr. Rudy Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Be blessed. Join host Dr. Rita Louise each week at this time for Just Energy Radio.